My career was uh, 42 years public safety. I started in 1978 as a corrections officer at the Arizona State Prison. And I know what you're all thinking. That young man started in 1978. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a great career, but I tell you, uh, being faculty here at Yavapai College has certainly been a highlight of my life uh, to take on the program directorship of the Administration of Justice Studies. In the, um, the work that I've done with a nonprofit called the National Center for the Prevention of Community Violence, it brought me into contact with Esther Chang. Esther Chang is the senior program manager for the International Women's Peace Group. And she connected with me on social media, interested in the work that we were doing with the NCPCV and the work that they're doing internationally to bring about peace throughout the world. And um, certainly struck an interest with me because our goal with the NCPCV is to interrupt the process of violence before it becomes an event. We want to not have people victimized by violence. And if we can achieve global peace, community peace, individual peace, I believe we can change society as a whole. And so what we'll talk about today in a kind of an informal manner, let's go over the global historic movement of peace. What have been some significant events that have happened um, uh, over the last couple of hundred years. And then let's talk a little bit about more of a local community impact. And because my background is in public safety, I wanna focus on a, on a program that speaks directly to how our police officials can help us achieve community peace and a violence-free uh, community. And then let's talk about what we can do as individuals. And that's what uh, hopefully over this next 50 minutes, we'll cover. And certainly if you have any questions or comments that you wanna add, there's a lot of experience in the room. I don't have the market on peace. I get it. Um, but all of us certainly can, can add to the conversation. So uh, just to kind of kick off and begin, uh, one, of the, one of the things about peace in my life is I've got 13 grandkids. And when they show up, chaos ensues. And so I suppose that was another reason why studying peace and how to control chaos interests me. Uh, Oxford describes, uh, defines peace as freedom from disturbance, a state of tranquility, a period in which there is no war or war has come to an end. Now it's of interest, Jenny, uh, that we, we put this together before Russia invaded Ukraine. And it's of interest that at this time that we're talking about peace globally, there's a war raging. But there has been over the last 5,000 years from research that the IWPG has done over the last 5,000 years, there has been conflict in the world 92% of the time over the last 5,000 years. 80% of those involve religious conflict. And it's of, of interest, though, that we uh, are having a wartime as we're having this conversation. Also of interest with the Oscars was the slap Will Smith gave to Chris Rock. And in looking at that posting on social media, I'm, I'm amazed at the social media post that, yep, he deserved to get slapped. And I'm just, and my response is like, where do we as a culture support acts of violence that way? And we're not afraid to say it. Yep, he deserved to get slapped. In front of how many people? The viewership had to be well over a million people saw it and 500,000 people are supporting it. It's also interesting that Oxford says peace is about law and order. And so when our community has the, the justice system in order and law and order prevail within a community, that community can be at peace. My time down in the, in the Valley, I was chief of police in Apache Junction and I lived in Casa Grande for almost 30 years. And, you know, in that community, you, could, you didn't leave your garage door open. You locked your car, locked your doors. Here in Prescott, 
ah, we left the garage door open again. It's, it's almost like a different feel in this community. We enjoy safety in this community. But I find it of interest that comment about peace is also about law and justice when we see the protesters that have happened over the last few years. And what does their sign say? No justice, no peace. The two are tied together. And Martin Luther King Jr. said in 1958 that peace is not merely the absence of tension, but the presence of justice. And I thought, wow, that is a powerful connection. Peace in a community and the justice that served within that community. All right, so let's look at some historical landmarks to kind of lay some foundation here. And, and there's a lot out there of individuals and organizations that were involved historically in the peace movement. I've focused on a few. In 1828, an individual by the name of William Lab, he began talking with the local peace societies in New York and Massachusetts and some other states, and he was able to pull them together in 1828 to form the American Peace Society. And what was significant about what they were doing at that time was they actually saw the value of getting elected officials to create peace resolutions. They wanted to legislate peace through these resolutions. They circulated petitions to pull in other citizens to the work of local peace. They also organized peace conferences. And I thought, oh, wow, man, I've enjoyed going to conferences. But in 1828, they had peace conferences. I wonder what kind of swag they gave out. Joni, what kind of swag do you think they gave out? It had, had to be cool stuff, right? Yeah. You can probably find some of it in the antique stores today. Um, they also published a periodical called The Advocate of Peace. Now, fast forward to um, another individual named Benjamin Trueblood. In 1899, he wrote a book called The Federation of the World. He drew his material from this book on the work of William Ladd in this idea of creating global peace. His comments surfed, surfaced at the Hague Convention in 1899. And the idea that this peace society that was created in 1828, those uh, principles begin to surface in world conversations. And the idea of a international body was surfacing and gaining strength. And then we saw in World War I, at the end of World War I, the League of Nations came forward. Now, this was actually the brainchild of President Woodrow Wilson. He produced a speech, we had 14 points, and it was his idea that we pull the nations together on the principle that war cannot happen again. And I'll read the principles here in a minute. But of interest in the League of Nations was um, the United States never signed on to it. 60 other countries bought into it. It was Woodrow Wilson's idea, but he could not get the political backing from, uh, from our own legislators. And part of it was because they were worried about the United States losing the autonomy to govern itself in 1919. But some of the principles there was the idea of disarmament, prevent war through collective security, settle disputes between countries through negotiation and diplomacy, and improve global welfare. Understanding that these forces are some of the conflict points that come about within societies. Next up was the United Nations. At the beginning of World War II, when Hitler pulled Germany out of the League of Nations and they started moving down the path to war, um, the United Nations came about at the end of that. And again, Franklin Roosevelt, our president, had a huge a part in the original creation, 50 nations signed on to the original charter in October of uh, 1945. 
their principles, save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small, establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained, practice tolerance, and live together in peace with one another as good neighbors. Interesting that Russia signed on to that, 1945. And just a few years later, NATO came about. We're hearing a lot about NATO right now in the news. But NATO came about in 1949 because what the West saw was Russia's aggression wasn't subsiding. And the fear was Russian expansionism would continue. And so NATO was created to create that buffer. You know, it's of interest, um, since the mid 90s, I've been involved in a lot of efforts uh, and trainings and organizations that dealt with gendered violence, addressing gendered violence. When the, the, our military, the allies released and they came upon the concentration camps where the Jewish um, captors were kept and they liberated them and they celebrated liberating these concentration camps. And yet we turned Berlin over to the Russian army. And at that time they estimate there was 2 million women and girls in Berlin and very few males. And the Russian army exploited and violated and committed atrocities against the women and girls in Berlin. Many were sold into slave labor and taken back to Russia. And yet the allies were silent on that. The war crimes don't seem to come out on that. I find that of interest um, with uh, NATO today. Part of NATO's um, was the idea of encouraging European political integration. So one of the other ones I don't have on the sheet here is the European Union. Came about November 1st, 1993. Respect for human dignity and human rights, freedom, democracy, equality, and the rule of law promoting peace and stability. These international organizations, multi-country organizations, all had the ideal that we come together for collective security, which will result in peace. That was like the bottom line of all these efforts. How do we create global peace and come together as, as one? In the work that I've done with the International Women's Peace Group, I learned of the HWPL in 2013. It stands for Heavenly Culture, World Peace, Restoration of Life. A Korean gentleman by the name of Man He Lee is the chairperson. Their goal, establishment of an international law of peace, religious unity, and peace academies throughout the world. They prepared a document called the Declaration of Peace, Secession of War in 2015. And let me share with you some of the principles of that document. And what they have succeeded in doing is having that document recognized by the United Nations, but it's not binding law. And that's what the, it's missing, is the fact that there's no international law that demands adherence to this document. But here's what the document says. Acknowledging that all members of the human family enjoy human dignity and equal and inalienable rights, that these rights represent a necessary tenet of the preservation of freedom, justice, and peace throughout the world, aiming to maintain international peace and security and determined to pass it to successive generations an invaluable inheritance of a world free of wars and the need to facilitate peaceful coexistence among the world's religions, beliefs, and ethnicities. Closely, the IWPG, International Women's Peace Group, works very closely with uh, Chairman uh, Mann 
In fact, they currently have branches in over 130 countries. Uh, I'm a member of the LA branch. So the work of peace is taking place around us. It's moving forward. We don't see it in the news all the time. What do we see in the news, right? If it bleeds, it leads is kind of the theme there. One of the things I'm very proud of, and uh, Dr. Andrews is here with uh, the Respect Campaign, is we will soon, in September, on International Peace Day, we will have our own peace poll right here on our campus. There are over 200,000 peace polls in the world, and almost every country is represented. This came about in 1955 from an individual in Japan, and his inspiration was may peace prevail on earth this currently is the project is housed now with the world peace prayer society headquartered in new york they are an ngo recognized by the united nations and uh, i think our day is coming up on september 21st and um the art department is actually creating our peace poll if if i'm the students, yeah, are creating our peace poll. What a, what a wonderful expression. But when we talk about symbolism, we, we have to think about symbolism. There's one other project I wanted to mention to you because uh, I've had an opportunity to visit Vietnam and I'm going back here uh, in the very near future uh, to work, do try to do some work with the University of Hanoi. But I came across this peace trees project in Vietnam. There's a province that was... When the war was raging, the no northmost province of South Vietnam, uh, trying, trying, I think is how you pronounce it, it was so heavily bombed, they estimate that more ordnance was dropped in this one province than all of World War II by the Allies. And so to this day, they are recovering ordnance through this Peace Trees pro program. Based out of Seattle, Washington, it was founded in 1995. Uh, the lady's name, excuse me for not remembering that, Gerilyn Brousseau. She was the sister of a U.S. Army pilot that was killed in Vietnam. But she created this opportunity to go back there and begin to do this work. And here's what they've done to date. They have cleared almost 5,000 acres of land they have removed and destroyed. Now, these were unexploded ordnance. 136,000 unexploded ordnance have been removed to date, benefiting almost 300,000 individuals. They have educated on explosive ordnance risk education almost 200,000 people, including 4,300 students that attend kindergarten. They have been able to support 215 victims and 62 families that have been affected by accidental explosions in that province. They've given out 3,200 scholarships. They've built 20 kindergartens, 12 libraries, two community centers, <coughs> and 100 family homes. And they have planted over 44,000 trees within that province. That's real work. That's real work. And what's so exciting for me is we were, we were at war in Vietnam. And it's been said that in the fog of war, morality is out the window. And we see the atrocities happening in Ukraine today. Well, they happened in Vietnam as well from our own soldiers. We'll talk about who are the victims of war. It's some Our soldiers are victims of war as well. This is real work going on in real places. And, and the symbolism behind it is so amazing. Now, how many of you have a favorite monument or a monument that you have visited that sticks out to you? Hey, Will, that sticks out to you. Yeah. The, the monuments in Washington, D.C., what, what was the one you were going to share? I went to go see the Statue of Liberty uh, on 9-11 a year and a half ago. And oh. it was just 
breathtaking. It was so different than what you see. It just was so huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone else want to share a favorite monument? Abraham Lincoln was my favorite statue and to read the walls all the way around. Oh, it, and in, wonder in, if they walked from the White House down there to read the walls. In D.C.? I was wondering, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's one thing that we do well in our country is, is memorials and monuments. Um, I didn't have to fight in Vietnam. I uh, graduated in 1975. The war had ended two years, I think two years before. I still had to register for the draft. It's like, really, what's up with that? There's no war going on here. My dad went, my dad fought in Vietnam. But when I visited the Vietnam Memorial in DC and those 56,000 names, it does something to you. I don't, I, I just, we, we do a good job with the monuments and symbols. That's why the Peace Pole is gonna be so impactful for us. This one here, I had the chance to visit Vicksburg Fredericksburg, Virginia, and the Civil War battlefield there in Fredericksburg in December of 1962, the, unions came, the Union forces were trying to attack Confederate defendant line, but they were having to go uphill to do so. They lost over 12,000 Union soldiers without being able to break through that line. At night, because it was too dangerous for the Union to go in and get their wounded and remove people from the battlefield, the cries of the wounded were loud and the Confederates could hear them, the Union could hear them. They were crying in agony, crying for water. It was December, it was cold. One Confederate soldier by the name of Richard Kirkland went to his commanding officer and said, I've got to go do something to ease this suffering. And at first he was denied. And then he, re, he, he continued and finally had permission. And he gathered as many blankets and canteens as he could carry. And he crossed the safety of their defensive line onto the battlefield. And at first the Yankees didn't know what he was doing. He was fired at until they realized he was going from wounded to wounded, giving them a blanket and offering them a drink of water. Saving their life? No, they're dying. But he provided comfort. He provided comfort to his enemy. And there's a monument to him there called the Angel of Mary's Heights. He was later killed in battle on another battlefield. And I was always worried when I started hearing about cancel culture and the idea that, you know what? We're not gonna put up with these Confederate status. I thought, oh, please don't take this one down. This is a human being easing the suffering of another human being. Something else about that battlefield, we talk about who are the victims of war. We know that women and children and citizens and men that are in those communities are victims of war, but our soldiers are victimized as well. And at this battlefield, there's graves with five Union unidentified soldiers, five unidentified soldiers, and their families never knew what the outcome of their life was. They died unknown to their fellow soldiers and they died unknown to their families. And then think about our soldiers that come home from war, wounded in heart and mind. War takes a toll and our soldiers go because their duty to their country not because they're killers, they go to represent our country. A little bit about a, a movement now that has caught uh, some attention. Uh, and before we get off the, the, the battlefield, have any of you seen Hacksaw Ridge? Hacksaw Ridge? Yeah, it is a true story of a individual, a man that joined the military in World War II because he wanted to serve but he was a conscientious objector and refused to touch a gun. It's a wonderful story. And what he told his commanding officer when he was constantly harassed and questioned about his views was that um, you, you're out there destroying life. I'm gonna be out there putting it back together. True story. He's accredited 
unarmed on the battlefield with saving 76 U.S. soldiers' lives because he stayed on the battlefield and got them to safety where they could get medical attention. 76. He is the first of conscientious objector to earn the Medal of Honor in our country. It's a wonderful story, a great movie if, if, uh, if you get a chance to see it. So this here is all about the idea of police officers and the idea of police officers having a mindset of peace. One of the things that works against, hey, James, feel free to jump in anytime there. James Tobin, one of the finest officers I've ever had the pleasure to work with and uh, played a big role in my coming to Prescott to begin with. So thank you for being here, James. If a, P, if a police officer can have the mindset that when they arrive on that call for service, their goal is to bring calm to chaos. Their goal is to bring a solution to seemingly no solution in a conflict. Now, having said that, we understand that there is chaos sometimes. Officers go in the middle of the night to pure chaos. Uh, one scene I was on in my younger days, um, a domestic call. I get there, and I was a young officer, didn't have all my tactics in order yet. So I pulled my police car right in front of the house, right? Well, the male of the house comes out the front door and has a long gun, and he aims it right at me. I crawl back through the front seat to the other side of the, the car. And then I was able to pull my gun and we were pointing our guns at each other. Finally, he drops his gun, runs back in the house. Me and my partner run into the house, chasing him. And we're flipping furniture around in the front room. And the whole time we're doing this, his two children are running around us saying, let go of my daddy. Let go of my daddy. It's pure chaos. But the mindset that we as our police force isn't this warrior-based occupying force. Instead, they're the guardians of peace within our community. And the majority of time that officers spend on their shift is in direct communication. Arizona Post did a survey of officers and found 90% of what we do is talk to people. And we work for solutions. We bring peace to chaos. And that's, that's what's going to take in some of these communities for true police reform to happen. We can't defund the police. Come on, really? We can fund other things to support public safety. Public safety has to exist, but we can also own some of the mistakes that we've made in policing when we've decided we are an, occupizing, an occupying force. Now, in some community, we're fortunate here in Yavapai County, uh, I think the community at large supports public safety. They appreciate the police that are here. And uh, I'm thrilled to live where I live, but that's not true in every community. There's a lot of discontent with police forces in some communities. Things like no knock search warrants. Can you imagine you're in your home and typically a no knock search warrant is done at night you're doing whatever you do in your home, and all of a sudden, your door gets kicked in. I mean, that, in my mind, is a perfect setup for a conflict. And so that's something that I think we in policing have to look at. Can we adjust our practices to avoid these unfortunate conflicts and tragedies? And I think there's certainly room for that. But the perception in some of these communities is that the cops are killers is that the cops are bad, that they're corrupt. And we know that there's bad apples in every profession, even in libraries, huh, Mike? You know, probably not many. <laughs> yeah. Art departments, right, Randall? I mean, you know, some of the artists out there, you know how they are. Um, anyway, here's some pictures from uh, what has been happening. And when you think about what do police do, we react, we respond. And just the fact that you get a 911 call, you're driving along in your car, it's been a slow shift, and the dispatcher hits what's called the alert tone. What that does to the psyche of the officer is it immediately changes their physiology. 
the hormones get released and it's like, oh, we're going at it now. That works against us when it comes to what our mission is. How many of you get up to an alarm clock as opposed to an opportunity clock? You know, how many of you, you know, and alarm clocks are fine. I, I don't have a problem with that. But, you know, they make them now where you can have the sound of water. You can have the sound of music instead of that. Uh, so this is where we get into the idea of no justice, no peace, is that people feel like until the cops start applying the principles of justice to their work, we're not going to like them. We're going to hate them. We're going to defund them. We're going to badmouth them. In New York City, we're going to pour water on them. We're going to shoot at them. And so there becomes, in some parts of our country, there's this us versus them mentality. We have to change that. Right here in, in Sedona, I had the opportunity to meet Lisa Broderick. She is the founder and director of a, pro, a nonprofit called Police to Peace. And they are currently promoting toolkits and 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 opportunities for communities and police officers to come together and have these conversations about how do we as community partners make our communities safe, make our communities full of law and order and peace. And the toolkits are, are amazing. I've got the opportunity to be the voice and the, the, the face of our curriculum. And uh, so I don't know what I think about that, Deb, but... Uh, Anyway, it's a, it's a wonderful project. It's one I believe in. For over 40 states call their officers peace officers. And yet we in the profession haven't embraced that as we could have. Time to do that. Time to embrace it. We can enjoy relationships with our community. We can enjoy restoring relationships when they've been harmed. I had the opportunity to serve with the NAACP in Casa Grande, and it followed an incident, a real bad incident involving one of our officers. The lady that ran it, Wanda Williams, was a friend. And at that meeting where we were talking about the incident, they called for saying, we need people to gather and be a part of this so that we could open lines of communication. It was a wonderful experience, wonderful experience. Facilitate peace in the community. Our police officers need to be the leaders at this. Need to be the leaders at this. Know the resources available in our community to help others. It's what we as a community want from our police. We want protection. We also want good service. Years ago, I had an opportunity to call the Phoenix Police Department. I think my, my, I bought a car for my son and it turned out to be a fraudulent title. So I'm calling Phoenix PD like, you know, well, they were in the, pro they were in the practice of hiring retired cops to answer the phone. So retired cop answers the phone. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, that's civil. Can't help you. I wanted so badly to tell him, look, I am the chief of police. <laughs> Don't make me go to your chief. But it was no service. Uh, another colleague that works with Dr. Websdale down at Arizona State University, they were in St. Louis at a substation in St. Louis Police Department, and a lady walked in with a purse and said, hey, I found this purse. Want to turn it in? Sorry, you have to take that downtown to the main station. Didn't even bother to look in the purse. Now, that's not what we expect from our police officials. That's not what we expect. We can do better. And being a peace officer is not soft on crime. It's smart on crime. It's smart on crime. It's safer for our officers. When I lived in Casa Grande for 23 years, I was a police officer there. I never worried about bumping into somebody that I had arrested because we treated them with respect. And people understand when they're being treated without respect. Here's the peace officer promise that we're hoping to promote. It's just a simple promise that says, while in the process of doing our job, we recognize we're not 
our, our best intentions are to do no harm to the community, to do no harm. Now, are the cops going to make a mistake every once in a while? Absolutely. We, we, we hire human beings to do our policing, and cops are going to make a mistake. I think I made a mistake once in 1985, I think it was. Yeah. My wife wrote it down. <laughs> yes. Uh, wasn't it? I don't know how to use this. Wasn't it within the last two years that state police cars all were, were remarked to say trooper? State oh, right. trooper? Yeah, yeah. Which is a war concept. Trooper. Yeah. Yeah, great, great point. And we think about imaging, right? And, uh, you know, for the, for the ease of the operation, now our officers wear an outer vest and they've got the tools, right? So when you see a police officer, they're well equipped. However, in that initial interaction with that officer, is that officer expressing respect for the person they're talking to? Are they being an active listener? Are they showing empathy? in how they do our jobs. You know, police get involved with people when, when some of the worst times of their life, and they're in chaos and their lives are coming undone. Our peace officers can be a part of the solution in bringing uh, calm to chaos. All right, so what ruffles your feathers? What ruffles your feathers? I'm not gonna ask you to share, I'll share one of mine. And I, I hate to admit this, you know those signs on the road that are suggested speed limits? Yeah, you know, it's suggested that you go, right, right? I, you get behind people that are driving so slow. And it's like, I've got some place to go. Will you move? So that kind of ruffles my feathers. It ruffles my feathers. Yeah. We all have things that ruffle our feathers. Don't, don't give me that look. You know, don't give me that look. So I'm a person that highly respects police officers. I tell them thank you when they pull me over for not following one of those signs. And I, but the thing that's really ruffled me is you see time and time again, these police officers that are having these issues brought against them and nothing is done and they just keep more issues, more issues, more issues. So when we're fixing policing, police should be policing themselves, in my opinion. You have to follow all the laws if you're going to arrest somebody for not following the laws. And I just think that's important. That's what ruffles me about police is I think yeah. we can do a little better there. Great, great point. Uh, and James and I would certainly agree with that. One of the movements that's happening right now is there's a big emphasis on officer wellness on understanding the cumulative effect on our police officers of seeing the worst and the bad on a daily basis. When I was a young officer in Casa Grande, at the end of two years, I thought, what a nasty little town I'm living in. And there was a psychologist named Kevin Gilmartin from the Tucson Police Department that came up and talked to us. And he was able to show how that if you are not careful you will quit seeing the good that exists. And what happened, my perception was, this town is horrible. And that psychologist was able to help me. And I think we're gonna see our officers understand that because wellness is becoming a big part of the conversation. It's, it's right here in Prescott, uh, Chief Amy, Bonnie, uh, they've all got these issues that they're working with their officers to make sure our officers are well. We all have our feathers ruffled from time to time, right? It's about perception. Not perception. How many of you saw the movie Jaws? And you couldn't swim. I cannot swim in water and I can't see my feet anymore after Jaws. A little bit of uh, perception again. This is the arch in St. Louis. How many of you would argue that it's taller than it is wide based on this picture? It, it appears to be taller, doesn't it? It's exactly the same distance, bottom to top. But our perception, and the point of this is our perceptions can be wrong. 
we can be wrong. So let's look at some things in the past and talk about how we as a society have evolved in some areas and can we evolve into a peace community. Vietnam War, our soldiers were treated horribly returning from the Vietnam War by society in general, right? That wouldn't happen today. And it doesn't matter what your view on war is. I mean, how many of us didn't agree with Iraq or whatever, but we understood we have to treat our servicemen and women better. We have to acknowledge their sacrifice and, and honor that sacrifice, whether we agree with our nation's decision to go to war or not. Civil rights movement. We have, in spite of what you may hear, we have made progress. When George Floyd was killed uh, a couple of years ago, at any given time in our country, there's almost 800,000 working law enforcement officials out there. One incident paints the whole profession, but we have made progress. I saw it in my career, and Arizona does it as good as any, any place in the country. This is from the Boston Marathon in 1967. A woman with the initials KL entered the Boston Marathon at a time when women weren't allowed to be in the Boston Marathon. At some point in the race, she takes the hood off and the race director sees, oh my God, there's a woman in my race. And he attempts to push her out and take her bib off of her. What, she did, what he didn't know was her boyfriend was running with her. And he proceeded to knock that director on his ass. It wasn't until 1972 that they changed and allowed women to enter. So it still took them five years. And if you look at any of the races out there today, 5Ks, 10Ks, whatever, the majority of the registrants are women in today's uh, races. Interracial marriage. In my lifetime, in our lifetime, this was illegal in certain states. It's my son-in-law. He's an MIT graduate engineer, has patents for his own creations. And that's my daughter. And you can tell she gets her looks from grandpa, right? Or from dad. Um, beautiful Irish lass. He is from Barbados, has a wonderful accent. And they have a wonderful marriage. I have two of the most beautiful mixed race grandchildren you've ever laid eyes on. This, this marriage was illegal. And I thought, don't the cops have something better to do than policing marriage? Look what else we did in the 1920s at the Potomac River. The police measured skirts to make sure that you women weren't showing too much leg. Have we changed as a society? <laughs> How many of you are baseball fans? Yeah. Have you ever seen a coach? run out and challenge an umpire on a call that probably was correct. What is, that, what is that guy doing? What is that coach doing? He's putting the umpire on notice. I'm watching you. I'm watching you. The challenge with us in sports is how many times does that behavior represent violence or behavior that is modeled now for our young people, right? This is necessarily not so good. Hey, Alia, this is my granddaughter, Alia. She's a student here at YC and works at the bookstore. Hey, Alia. <laughs> Who was the sponsor of the Flintstones in 1962? Not the creator. Who was the sponsor? I'm hearing cigarettes. That's correct. Winston tastes good like a... You'll find that on YouTube. They're singing the jingle, Wilma and Fred in their home, smoking a Winston. That would be unheard of today. 1972, when we landed at Fort Huachuca, my dad's final duty station, as a 16-year-old, I could buy a pack of Marlboro at the PX for a quarter. I bought a six-pack of Budweiser at the PX at age 16 unheard of today, right? We change as a society, we evolve. 
So what are the superpowers of peace? Respect, civility, kindness. These are all the things we can hope to pull into our lives and practice. And one of the things I love about our campus is the idea of the outward mindset that we've adopted here at our campus. All of these things can morph into that because when we're thinking about these superpowers, we're focusing outwardly on other individuals. How does my behavior and how does my life impact you? And I had to learn the hard way that it's not always about me. And uh, huh, Alia, not always about grandpa, right? Right. But the benefits, though, of my making sure that your needs are met through all these different behaviors is that it's reciprocal. We become a better society when these characteristics are there. Starting points of peace. And what I would encourage you to do is recognize that you as a human being have value. That you are one of a kind and that your value is tremendous in who you are as a member of the human family. And when you begin to acknowledge that within yourself, you can begin to appreciate, well, you have value and you have value and you have value. And we see the value in one another. There was a 14-year-old girl when I was down in uh, Apache Junction, 14-year-old girl on a school bus in the city of Mesa. And they captured this on the bus camera. And she was having a fit. She got into a fight with the driver. And somebody made the comment in the media, oh, that little piece of... I thought, no. There's a reason a 14-year-old girl is going to act out. And it's not because she's a little piece of worthlessness. She has value. Sometimes our troubles, our trauma comes to the surface. But if we look at each other with how do we address that? How do we bring calm and peace back to another individual? And we practice that through kindness, empathy, tolerance, forgiveness. Outward mindset. Maintain your own emotional and mental health. Practice gratitude. Researchers are saying that if you are grateful, and they, they even recommend in some places, do, do a journal. What are you grateful for? That that releases those good hormones into your system. It actually has a physical effect on you. Appreciate what you have. Acknowledge you don't know it all. We struggle with that, huh? You know, I've been a cop for 42 years. I know everything about it, James. Yeah. yeah. Not. Not. Shelby has taught me more about policing probably in the last year. <laughs> Acknowledge that you may be wrong from time to time. This is from the, the book we were provided on our campus. The biggest lever for change is not a change in self-belief, but a fundamental change in the way one sees and regards your connections and obligations to others. Our obligations to one another as a part of a peaceful society. It drives and shapes all we do, how we engage with others and how we behave in every moment and situation. Behavior is a product of mindset. And the outcome of that behavior starts with mindset. If you want to have a different outcome, it's not a behavioral change, it's a mindset change. These are the benefits of a peaceful life. And I, wow. You know, we talk about benefits as an employee of the college, right? Where's HR? HR, come on now. We got to list these as our benefits. These are the benefits of a peaceful life continued. A lot of these are from the respect campaign, certainly. Here's what we avoid. These are things we're in control of that we can avoid. Labeling, bias, judgment, criticism, defeat and failure, challenges. These are the things we can avoid by adopting a mindset of peace as an individual, understanding that there are organizations like police agencies that are moving 
towards a different mindset, that they're peace officers? And then also, where can we support the global effort? You know, I find it a very interesting that Russia is a part of the UN Security Council. And the Security Council voted to, uh, I don't know, do something about the war. And Russia vetoed, Russia vetoed the vote. I thought, you know, that's a conflict of interest, isn't it, Stacey? Yeah, I mean, do these international bodies need some work? I think so. I think they could use a little help. We're not there yet, but we see the mindset is moving in that direction, right? When we think about our local officials, do we look at a track record of tolerance, forgiveness, of kindness, of respect, and of civility? We, yeah, you know, and... It's the, the politics I said I don't in think our nation any of them today. Would get elected. Yeah, Thank you. yeah the, the politics in our nation today are less than civil. And it's no more about a debate of differing opinions. Now it's more about how do I destroy my opponent? We have to change that. We have to change that. We can demand more of our politicians. We can demand more of our leaders. And we don't demand it in a demeaning kind of a way. Yeah. Deb is the chairperson of the Prescott Union uh, High uh, Governing Board, District Board. School boards have faced some very uncivil moments. Um, and Deb, you are a master in maintaining peace in those hearings. Not every school board in the country has enjoyed leadership like yours. Um, thank you for what you do for us here. That's my presentation. Um, when you are at peace, you can change your world and you can lay your head down and rest. <laughs> that's, my, that's our dog, Harley. Yeah, and he's a sweetie. I don't know what he was doing there. I was downstairs there and also I noticed he's just laying there looking at me. Like, I love my grandpa. Do we have any questions from the audience or any questions in the chat? Uh, Jerry, when I was in elementary school, the police would come into the school. And that's how I learned to respect police and know they were my friend. Do the police still do that in schools? I mean, I just don't know. Yeah, SROs are a great question. And what we've seen around the nation is the right officer in the school will have a wonderful impact. The wrong officer will have a terrible impact. And so it's interesting that the SROs got caught up in the defund the police, and now there's a lot of schools wanting to put them back in. Uh, when I was chief in Prescott, Bill Wolf was our SRO. The students loved him. He's a wonderful officer and represented us so well. Uh, so yeah, I, I think SROs are good, but it's got to be the right officer. Thank you, Professor Monahan, for your presentation. I have a comment rather than a question. Um, I get very discouraged and very sad when I see the way that our culture and our society is. And what I really appreciated about your presentation was that, first of all, you showed that change can happen and that in recent years, change has occurred and that's reassuring. Yeah. And I really also appreciated the strategies that you offered that showed how we can do little things to affect change. And it makes me feel that I can do little things and that I can contribute to creating a more peaceful community and hopefully a broader peaceful climate. And so um, as usual, you inspire me and I'm proud to call you a colleague. <laughs> Thank you, Randy, I appreciate that. Thank you. Little by little, increment, little increments at a time, yeah. Are there any other questions? And I'd like to say thank you to Gerald Monahan for coming here today.